All right, now when we ended last week, we were just about finished looking at the paired parables of the tower builder and the king going to war in Luke 14, 28 to 33. And I gave you, let's see, does this come on? Yeah, in, in this sixth category, the call to a kingdom decision, tower builder and the king going to war, I gave you my understanding of those two parables and then read to you David Wenham's summary of the meaning. Now, Wenham, you'll recall, he, he was a, a professor or, or taught New Testament, I think, at Oxford for a couple of decades, 24 years. I gave you his summary. I wanted to reinforce that with a few more quotes from scholars about the meaning of the tower builder and the king going to war. I want to read those quotes, and then we'll move on. <clears throat> G.B. Caird, in his commentary, says, The twin parables of the tower builder and the king were not meant to deter serious, any serious candidates for discipleship, but only to warn them that becoming a disciple was the most important enterprise a man could undertake and deserved at least as much consideration as he would give to business or politics. And this is the thing. See, when somebody comes and, and is brought to a decision, they need to see how momentous that decision is. They need to understand that. This isn't falling off a log. This is life changing. And so that's what they need to see. Nobody can be swept into the kingdom on a flood tide of emotion. He must walk in with clear-eyed deliberation. You can't sneak somebody into the kingdom. You can't conceal from them what the Lord calls them to. They come in with clear-eyed deliberation. Klein Snodgrass in his book, Stories with Intent, he says, in their present context, the parables are clearly intended to warn against a premature and unaware acceptance of discipleship. Discipleship is no light matter. And the urgency of the call, and there is an urgency to the call. The urgency of the call does not diminish the seriousness of the commitment. With these parables, Jesus does not seek to deter discipleship. That's not what he's interested in doing, but his goal is not merely to gain as large a following as possible. He's, you remember when he, he says something, people leave him, and he turns to the disciples and said, would you go too? He didn't go, whoa, wait, wait a minute, then, no, 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 that's not what I meant. His goal is not just to get large numbers. His goal is to call people to discipleship. He goes on, he says, the point of the parables is clear. Who would begin to build a tower without analyzing whether he or she had resources to accomplish the task? No one. What king would think of going out to defeat an attacking king without analyzing whether resources were sufficient for victory or whether submission is more advisable? No king would. Just as foolish would be any thought of being a disciple without assessing the impact on one's life. Discipleship changes allegiances with family, requires the willingness to die, shifts the focus off self-centeredness, places one at the disposal of another and changes the way one handles financial resources. It changes everything. It changes everything. There is no greater decision to be made. He says, T.W. Manson reportedly commented, salvation may be free, but it is not cheap in the sense of that Christ calls us to come and die. Craig Evans in his commentary says, the point that Jesus is making is that whenever one sets out to undertake a difficult or dangerous task, one should carefully assess one's resources. In these parables, one's money, first parable, or one's soldiers, second parable, should be understood as one's level of commitment to Jesus. If one lacks adequate commitment, then one should not follow. See, we, we don't have the right to make up Christianity. We don't have the right to say, I know Jesus calls me to that, but I'm not going to give that. I'm going to go a middle road. I'm going to create something else. I'm going to give him token allegiance. That's not Christianity. And we don't have the right to do that. 
He says, if one lacks adequate commitment, then one should not follow. Rather, if one is to follow Jesus, then a total commitment is expected, a commitment arising out of a careful, thoughtful consideration. See what the Lord calls you to. John Nolan in his commentary, this is the last one. He says, the parables in 14, 28 to 32 provide support for the challenge of verses 26 and 27. You remember 26 and 27, he laid out the radical call of discipleship. And then in 28 through 33, he explains why he's doing that. Because you must assess whether you have the resources to complete the mission, to begin the enterprise. So he says the parables, they provide support for the challenge of verse 26 and 27. It's all very well to want to be a disciple, but the demands of 26 and 27 identify the necessary resources without which there could be no successful implementation of discipleship. To rush without thought into the project of discipleship is like a person who begins to build a tower without the resources needed to complete it. He looks ridiculous. Or it is to be like the king who then, who when challenged by another king, rushes out to sure defeat without considering that with half, half the troops of his opponent, he can anticipate only disaster. Far better if he had sued for terms of peace. So I just wanted to read you those as reinforcing. I think this is an important and I think too often neglected aspect of discipleship and of Christianity and we need to call people to this now the last category of parables that I have is living as kingdom participants so we've gone through a number of categories that I've used and I've said a number of times sometimes the parables would fit in more than one category and I may not have chosen the best one but here's a category of Living as kingdom participants, and I have a number of subcategories under this, the first of which is attitude toward God. And I have one parable there, and it's the parable of the humble servant in Luke 17. This parable occurs in Luke 17, 7 to 10, and it follows Jesus' instruction in Luke 17, verses 1 through 5, about not creating stumbling blocks for fellow Christians, and the need to forgive a penitent brother or sister repeatedly. So not to create stumbling blocks, and the need to forgive a penitent brother or sister repeatedly. And Jesus then says in Luke 17, 7 to 10, Will any one of you who has a servant or slave plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. And see, this parable, the parable illustrates what our attitude should be in serving God. The point is that our obedience to God as disciples, even in matters as difficult as repeated forgiveness. You see, that gets difficult. But our attitude in service to God as disciples, even in matters as difficult as repeated forgiveness, is no favor to God so that He owes us anything for doing it. That's the attitude. It's no favor to him so that he is indebted to us. He now owes us for doing it. You see, it's not that way. In meeting the demands of the kingdom, in meeting those demands, we're simply doing what we should be doing. That's all we're doing, what we should be doing. It's fulfillment of our duty, not something that gives us any claim on God. It doesn't give us a claim, so we have done this, therefore you owe us this. It has not put God in our debt. Craig Blomberg remarks, he says, God's people should never presume that their obedience to his commands has earned them his favor. Well, look at all I've done. That song we sing, I work so hard for Jesus, I often boast and say... I've sacrificed a lot of things. You see that attitude there. Of course, in the song, it's being critiqued, <laughs> you see. 
Evan, Craig Evans says, Jesus does not mean to rule out heavenly reward for faithful service, but he means only to instruct his disciples as to how they should think. The point of the saying is concerned with attitude. An arrogant attitude views God as fortunate for having people like us in his service. That's the attitude that he's after. You are really fortunate to have me. Do you know what I do? See, that spirit and that heart and that attitude, that's not the attitude of a disciple. He says, perhaps this was a Pharisaic attitude. The proper attitude, however, is thankfulness for having the privilege and opportunity to serve God. What reward we have for serving God is not earned, but is given because God is gracious. No Christian can boast before God. You and I have things we are to do. God calls us to live away. He commands us to live away. And when we live out discipleship, we don't thereby put God in our debt and say, you see, I've done this. Now you owe me this. He never owes you anything. You have only done your duty. You are like the servant who doesn't come in and do something he's obligated to do. And then turn around and say, well, I did this. Well, of course you did that. You did that because that was your role and function. And it doesn't put me in your debt. That's our relationship. Now, the rhetorical question that you have in, in, verse, in verse 9 there. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? That rhetorical question literally is, he does not have gratitude. It's Karen. He does not have gratitude toward the servant because he did the things that were commanded, does he? And the gratitude that is referred to there, it's more than a mere verbal expression. It carries this sense of indebtedness. You see, you have not thereby put God in your debt so that he is somehow obligated to repay you. Cessless Spick in his theological lexicon of the New Testament he says uh, uh, of this uh, on this use of the word he says a person does not stop at merely feeling gratitude toward a benefactor but makes an effort to pay him back as if paying off a debt by returning benefit for benefit see that's the sense that's there you haven't put God in your debt by doing what was commanded your attitude is I'm an unworthy servant. I've simply done what I should have done. I, didn't, I don't put you in my debt at all. You don't owe me anything. I'm just doing what I should be doing. And that's the attitude we're to have. Now this, of course, it isn't a full-blown view of God. You can make mistakes. You see, if you take one teaching, one thing, and you make it the centerpiece and blow it up and then force everything to fit it, you're going to get in trouble. You have to understand these things show pieces, aspects of relationships, and you have to understand these things in balance. David, or, yeah, David Wenham says, It is clear from other parts of Jesus' teaching that the Lord does treat his slaves as his children, not just as servants. See the parable of the prodigal son John, and John 15, 15. It's also true that the Lord rewards his faithful servants and that far from treating them callously, he... he will himself sit down at table and serve them. See Luke 12, 37. But this is all his generosity. It is because of him that they can work in the kingdom in the first place, and although he chooses to reward them for their service, they can never claim credit for their work. Their attitude can only be that of humble, grateful servants. Grateful to have the privilege and the opportunity to serve the Almighty God. That's what he's after. That's the attitude. That's what he's after in this particular teaching and in this parable. Next subcategory, living as kingdom participants. Living righteously before men. And here I put salt and light from the Sermon on the Mount. So those of you who are in here for the Sermon on the Mount, you're just going to have to hear it again. Because somebody who's watching or somebody else in the class may not have heard that before but Jesus description of the disciples as as salt of the earth and light of the world that occurs here in Matthew 5 
13 to 16. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now you may remember that in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, Jesus instructed the disciples to rejoice in the persecution they inevitably will face. Inevitably will face. He instructs them to rejoice in that persecution they will face. And to do that by focusing on the great reward that is in store for those who endure in faith. And in Matthew 5, 13 and 16, he then warns them about two other possible reactions to persecution. He's telling them you need to rejoice and you need to do it by focusing on the great reward that is in store for those who endure. But then here he instructs them and warns them about other possible reactions to persecution. Salt, as you know, it had a number of, of uses in the ancient world. There were a number of different uses, most of which were beneficial. Salt, was then as it is today, it was a seasoning that improved the flavor of food. I love salt. <laughs> it, was a, it improved the flavor of food. It also seems to have served some kind of hygienic function. In the case of newborns, whether as a cleaning solution or whether it was something that retarded bacteria and therefore odor in the child's swaddling cloth. So it was used somehow. It had a hygienic function in the case of newborns. But its most critical use in the ancient world was as a preservative. Salt slowed the decay of meat, which in the days before refrigeration, that was very important. They had no refrigerators. So salt could be used to slow the decay of meat and to preserve it. Now, whether one focuses only on salt's use as a preservative or includes uh, the references and the other uses that were beneficial, the quality of salt that is under consideration in Jesus' metaphor is the powerful and positive effect that it has on that to which it is applied. Whether you take just the preservative or you take these other beneficial effects of the use of salt, he's talking about the powerful and positive effect that salt has on that to which it's applied. And Jesus says to his disciples in chapter 5, verse 13, that they are the salt of the earth. They are the salt of the earth because in living the way that Jesus calls them to live, as he does all through the Sermon on the Mount, he calls them to this radical ethic. And in living the way that he calls them to live, they will have a powerful and positive effect on the world. They will benefit the world by influencing positively the world's standards and practices, and they will benefit the world by drawing people into the kingdom of God. So you are the salt of the earth in that you have this positive and powerful effect on this world. As you live according to the uh, teachings, my commands, what I'm calling you, as you live out a life of discipleship. But Jesus adds the warning that if Christians abandon the faith, if they abandon the faith and thus surrender their distinctive character and ethics, if they become tasteless or unsalty salt, if they return to being like the world in the hope of deflecting the hostility and the persecution about which he's speaking, then they will cease to be of any benefit to the world. So he says, you are the salt of the earth. In living the way I call you to live, you will have a powerful and positive effect on this world. But if you abandon that call, 
You become tasteless or unsalty salt, then you will be of no benefit to the world. If instead of rejoicing and being glad in the face of insult and persecution and slander, you jettison your distinctiveness and you blend back into the world. If you fall away, you're suitable only to be discarded, thrown out into the street, where you'll be trampled. Now the language of the second part of verse 13, where he says, no longer good for anything, no longer benefit, where it says, except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet, he seems to move beyond the loss of benefit that they as faithful disciples would have on the world And he seems to be indicating that as apostates, you see, there's something worse in store. As those who would abandon the faith, they will be subject to divine condemnation. And the suggestion where he says here that salt that has lost its saltiness cannot regain it. You see, what I think he's doing there is that he's painting the picture. He's giving you a worst case scenario. They cannot regain it. It's similar to what is done in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to to 6. He gives this worst case scenario to fortify his point about the danger of abandoning the faith in light of persecution. If you try to deflect this by falling away and denying who I am and going back to living like the world, if you become unsalty salt, there is a grave danger. And the danger is, he says, you cannot come back. You can apostatize. You can go to the point, be there so obstinately, so deliberately, and so long that you get to the point that you cannot repent. You've gone beyond a point of no return. And he paints it that way. He paints it that way, the same way the writer in Hebrews 6 is, to emphasize the danger that he's talking about. Now light, that's a symbol of righteousness and enlightenment in John chapter 8. Verse 12, Jesus says of himself, I am the light of the world. And Christians are to be the light of the world. They are to show the light of Christ in the way that they live. You see that in Ephesians 5, 8, and 9, Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. We're we're to show the light of Christ in this dark world. That's how we're to live. We are a living demonstration that the kingdom of God has arrived. That's what the community is. We are a living demonstration that the kingdom of God has invaded this reality. And it is now here and present, albeit there's an overlap, as I've talked about. But that is what we are. We are a living demonstration of that invasion. And that's very, that's very important for us to understand. A city on a hill and a lighted lamp They relate to Christians being the light of the world and that just as concealment is incompatible with the nature of a city on a hill. I mean, you have this city that's up there. You don't conceal that. It's incompatible with its nature. It's, It's not something that can be concealed. So it's incompatible with the nature of a city and it's contrary to the purpose of a lighted lamp. So how is this tied into this idea of Christians being the light? Well, concealment's incompatible with the nature of a Christian. Just as it's incompatible with the nature of a city on a hill, and it's contrary to a Christian's purpose, just as concealment is contrary to the purpose of a lighted lamp. You light the lamp to give light. You don't light it and hide it. See, so this is what he's talking about. A living faith in Jesus Christ will inevitably express itself. That is its nature. It will express itself. It will result in a transformed life. It cannot be concealed. Christians are new people. We are new people in a new situation. We're not the same person just in a different forensic situation where we've been forgiven, we are in a different situation that we've been forgiven, but we are not the same people. We are new people, changed people, transformed people, spirit-empowered people. And you cannot be that 
and not have that evident in your life. And see, so it's contrary to the nature of a Christian to conceal his light bearing. It's contrary to that. See, it can't be concealed. A faith that doesn't manifest itself in works is what James calls, of course, in James chapter 2, what? A dead faith. It is a non-saving faith. It is a, not a biblical faith. It is not what Scripture means when it speaks of faith. Scripture speaks of faith not simply as intellectual assent. I know I say this ad nauseum. It is not simply believing certain things. It is surrendering to those things and living pursuant to that belief. Otherwise, it's dead. It is not biblical. It is not saving. It makes no, if faith makes no observable difference in a person's life, it is not the faith of which the Bible speaks. It is not biblical saving faith. Moreover, concealing one's Christian life is contrary to, to our role as a source of light for the world. It makes no more sense to hide one's Christ-motivated righteousness, to hide that from other people. It makes no more sense to do that than to put a lamp under a basket where it can't fulfill the purpose for which it was lit, which is to provide light. It just makes no more sense. That's what he's talking about when he speaks about this. Christians are openly, we are openly to live exemplary lives, not to parade our goodness, not to sit here and say, aren't I something? We are to do it to direct attention to God who is the source of that living and is the source of every good gift. That is why we do it. It is to draw attention to the one who has blessed us and transformed us and who provides all things. And Jesus is here warning about the temptation to go underground with one's faith, to be a secret Christian, to try to work and live like the world so nobody will think I'm a Christian so I won't bear the consequences of persecution. I don't want to be that. I want to basically abandon the faith, live like the world so nobody gets a clue that I'm a Christian, but I still want to claim to be one. And he's warning about that. He's warning them that they can't do that. See, if instead of rejoicing and being glad in the face of insult and persecution and slander, we seek to hide our Christian distinctiveness, well, then we're subverting our mission, that mission to be light of the world. <clears throat> Third subcategory, living as kingdom participants. This is living as kingdom participants in relation to others. And here I have a number of sub-subcategories. And the first one I want to look at is the lost sheep in Matthew chapter 18, verses 12 to 15. Now, the parable of the lost sheep, it occurs in Matthew 18, and it also occurs in Luke 15, verses 1 to 7. And these are variations of a parable that Jesus told at different times for different purposes. We already looked at the version in Luke. We looked at Luke's version in Luke 15, I discussed that in the section on the kingdom being good news for the needy. You see, Luke is, it, the, the parable functions differently there in that setting. When Jesus used the parable there, he, this idea that, listen, God is, those who are away from God do not cease to be important to God because they're away from Him. He still is focused on them and cares about them and loves them. But here it's different. Here he's talking about disciples. In Matthew, the parable comes right on the heels of Jesus admonishing the disciples not to look down on or to adopt the world's contempt toward even a single Christian. He says in, in Matthew 18, 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones he's instructing them see that you do not despise one of these little ones for i tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven so here he, he tells them in 1810 see that you do not despise one of these little ones and that word despise there in the standard greek lexicon it means 
to look down on someone or something with contempt or aversion, with implication that one considers the object of little value. Do you, do you get the spirit to look down on with contempt? You're just worthless. You're not worth anything to me. I can't be bothered with you. You're dirt. You, you don't matter. That's the idea, and he's saying, don't you do that. You don't adopt the world's contempt toward any of these little ones. And then he backs up that admonition with that statement, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. He's warning them against viewing other Christians as being of little value. Now that's a temptation. He's warning them against viewing other Christians as being of little value by saying that angels who belong to Christians, he says they're angels. Well, how do angels belong to Christians? They belong to Christians in the sense they serve Christians, as it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. See, they're angels. He backs up this admonition by saying they're angels. Always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And what he's talking about there is that they have immediate access to God. They have immediate access to God and they constantly make known to God the circumstance of their charges. This is done in courtly language. This idea of they, they always see the face of my Father. It is this idea of a heavenly court and here are their angels. He's backing up this admonition not to look down on any of these Christians because their angels, as in a court scene, always have immediate access to the Father. They are always there, you see, right before Him. And what He's doing, he, it's a way of emphasizing that God will in no way overlook the situation of the lowliest of His people. It's simply a way of reinforcing that truth, making it stronger. His omniscience, God's omniscience, his, the fact he knows all things, which is foolproof, right? God knows if you are treating a fellow Christian that way, if you are despising them, if you are looking down on them, if you are treating them as though they're insignificant and not important and can be steamrolled. What do I care about them? God knows that in his omniscience. Well, then what's this stuff about the angels? He's simply emphasizing it. His omniscience, which is foolproof, is backed by angelic whistleblowers. So his being unaware of the circumstance of the lowliest of his disciples is a double impossibility. Because their angels have unfettered, immediate access, and they report to God what is going on with their charges. Well, is he denying God's omniscience? Of course not. It's simply a way of saying God is absolutely, positively aware of mistreatment of his people. You see, so he's talking to disciples, and he's urging them and warning them about this. So Jesus says in Matthew 18... 12 to 14, what do you think? Right here, so this, I, I have to do this so you can see how the parable functions in this context. It functions differently in Luke. Here he says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the... More than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones. Little ones. Well, who are little ones? Don't look down. Don't despise one of these little ones. Why? Their angels always see. He's talking about disciples. He says, it is because it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And see, the parable, it's a statement of God's intense concern for every one of his little ones. You know, not just, not people that you think have altitude, 
people you think are, you know, big name, whatever that. God's concern for every one of his little ones, his concern for every disciple. And the point is that if God feels this way about every disciple, if he feels this way about every disciple, then we must be very careful how we treat every disciple. We have to be very careful about that. We can treat no Christian as though he or she were expendable. And I hate to say, but you see this in congregations. You see this in congregations where they want to introduce something and somebody comes and tells them, people are going to be bummed by this. They're going to be destroyed by this. And people will sometimes say, too bad. Too bad. I don't care what happens to them. Kick them to the curb like they're trash. That's not right. (laughs) That's not right. And yet you see that kind of thing go on. See, we must reflect God's interest in their not perishing. Which means we must value them rather than look down on them. And we must act with concern for their spiritual well-being, right? He's interested that not any of them perish. So you and I must have an interest in the spiritual welfare of our brothers and sisters. We have to. Because he has an intense concern over every one of them that none of them will perish. So you and I must have that and must reflect that. And part of that concern, by the way, is being willing to confront them with their sin as Jesus makes clear in Matthew 18, what? 15 to 20. That didn't just drop in. He's talking about how the Father who's in heaven, that one of these... It's not the will of my Father who's in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And then he gives us the thing of disfellowshipping. Well, what is that? Is that mean? Is that nasty? Is that hateful? No! It is a way of expressing love toward people that as a body of Christ, we are calling them to faithfulness. Why? Because he's concerned that none of, the, none of these little ones perish. And so that means and includes that we confront them with their sin as he says there, it is not loving to allow people to simply drift off and live in sin and the church says nothing to them about it. Do you think that's loving? That's not loving. That's selfish. That's just ignoring them. And we do it because we don't want the confrontation. Nobody wants the confrontation. But we are called to do it. We are called to do it as God's people. Next sub-sub-category, okay? Living as kingdom participants in relation to others. And I heard that bell, so we're not going to get through this probably, but it says the unforgiving servant. This is in Matthew 18, 23 to 35. Now, the parable of the unforgiving servant, it occurs only here, and it's preceded by the Lord's discussion of the need to bring a Christian to repentance through disfellowshipping if necessary. You see, that's the last resort. But the goal is redemption. The goal is rescue. The goal is love. So it's preceded by the need to bring a Christian to repentance through disfellowshipping if necessary and the need to forgive a, Christ, a penitent Christian repeatedly. You see that in Matthew 18, 21 to 22. That's what precedes it. The need to bring one to repentance through disfellowshipping if necessary and the need to forgive a penitent Christian repeatedly. Brothers or sisters come and they're they're penitent and we are to forgive them. Jesus then says, Matthew 18, 23 to 35, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So this servant fell down and pleaded with him. Have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported this to their, to their master, all that had taken place. 
Then the master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me? And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Okay, right after that, the need to forgive the penitent Christian repeatedly, he then tells them this parable. And it is powerful. Now, as I said with regard to the parable of the talents, a talent was equal to about 6,000 denarii. Okay, and a, a denarius was a standard day's wage for a day laborer. So a denarius was a day's wage for a day laborer. And one talent was equal to 6,000 denarii. So 10,000 talents would be 200,000 years of wages. Assuming the person worked roughly 300 300 days a year, which would be reasonable. And 100 denarii would be less than one year's wages. So we have the master who forgives 200,000 years worth of wages. And this guy then goes and refuses to forgive less than one year's wage. And the point of the parable is clear, isn't it? It is absolutely, completely outrageous for a Christian who has been forgiven a breathtakingly large sin debt to God to turn around and refuse to forgive the relatively minuscule sin debt of a fellow Christian who seeks forgiveness. Where we've been forgiven this ridiculous debt owed to God. And then this relatively minuscule debt, we are forgiven, He comes and wants our forgiveness, and we say, drop debt, I'm not going to do it. Please, please, I'm sorry. I didn't, you know, I, I did wrong. Forgive me, forgive me. No. No, no. Aren't you the guy who was just forgiven this amazing debt? Well, that's us, right? Do you see how, I mean, do you see how absurd that is? Do you see how outrageous that is? That is the second bell, isn't it? Well, that's how it works. Thanks for coming.